Welcome to Chilling Chronicles, 5 Terrifying Serial Killers. In this gripping exploration of the darkest recesses of the human psyche, we delve into the horrifying stories of 5 serial killers who left a trail of terror and tragedy in their wake. Viewer discretion is advised as we recount the disturbing details of their crimes. Prepare to be both horrified and fascinated as we unravel the chilling mysteries surrounding these killers. We will journey into the minds of these remorseless predators, uncovering the grim details of their heinous acts and exploring the relentless pursuit of justice. So, without further ado, let's begin our journey into the abyss. Ross was born in Putnam, Connecticut on July 26, 1959 to Patricia Hilda Lane and Dan Graham Ross. The oldest of four children, having two younger sisters and a younger brother, he grew up on a chicken farm in Brooklyn, Connecticut. Ross's home life was extremely dysfunctional, his mother, who had abandoned the family at least once and had been institutionalized, beat all four of her children, saving the worst for him. Some family and friends have suggested that he was also molested by his teenaged uncle, who committed suicide when Ross was six. He was a bright boy who performed well in school. He graduated from Killingly High School in Killingly, Connecticut in 1977, and graduated from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, where he studied agriculture, in May 1981. He became an insurance salesman. He exhibited antisocial behavior from a young age. Ross began stalking women in his sophomore year of college and, in his senior year, he committed his first rape. His first murder followed soon after. Between 1981 and 1985, Ross murdered eight girls and women aged between 14 and 25 in Connecticut and New York. He raped seven out of his eight murder victims. He also was alleged to have raped, but not killed a 21-year-old woman named Vivian Dobson in 1983. Plainfield police rejected the possibility that Ross had been Vivian Dobson's rapist. They did not press charges and Ross made no confession. Ross confessed to each of the eight murders and was convicted for the last four of them. He was sentenced to death on July 6, 1987 and spent the next 18 years on death row. During his incarceration, he met his fiancée, Susan Powers, of Oklahoma. Powers broke up with Ross in 2003 but still visited him until his death. He became a devout Catholic after his arrest in 1984 meeting regularly with two priests through the years and praying the rosary each morning. Ross had accomplishments such as translating Braille, acting as a big brother to other inmates, and sponsoring an impoverished child from the Dominican Republic. Though he opposed the death penalty, Ross strongly supported his own death sentence in the last year of his life, saying that he wanted to spare his victims' families any more pain. According to Catherine Yeager, a Cornell graduate, Ross believed that he had been forgiven by God and that he would be going to a better place once he was executed. She said, he's not being punished. He's moving on to life eternal. That's what is ironic about the death penalty. He's looking forward to the peace. Jaeger also said that Ross had come to believe there was no way his death sentences would be commuted without forcing the victim's families to suffer through more legal hearings and that he knew his life would be meaningful, even behind bars, he's had a horrible life, and he's wanted to do good. In spite of this, an hour before the execution was to take place in the early hours of January 26, 2005, Ross's lawyer, acting on behalf of Ross's father, obtained a two-day stay of execution. Ross was then scheduled to die by lethal injection on January 29, 2005, at 2.01 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. However, earlier in the day, the execution was again postponed because of doubts that Ross was mentally competent, having fought against his death sentence for 17 years, he suddenly waived his right to appeal. His attorney claimed that Ross was incompetent to waive appeals, as he was suffering from death row syndrome. In his final days, Ross became an oblate, or associate, of the Benedictine Grange, a Roman Catholic monastic community in West Reading, Connecticut. Ross was executed by lethal injection on May 13, 2005, at Osborne Correctional Institution in Summers, Connecticut. He was 45 years old. Ross did not request a special last meal before facing his execution, thereby dining on the regular prison meal of the day, turkey a la king with rice, mixed vegetables, 
white bread, fruit, and a beverage. When asked if he would like to make a last statement, he said, without opening his eyes, No, thank you. Ross was pronounced dead at 2.25 a.m. His remains were buried at the Benedictine Grange Cemetery in Reading, Connecticut. Henry Louis Wallace Even though the chips were stacked against him in childhood, Henry Louis Wallace showed a lot of promise. He was raised by a single mother who worked long hours for little pay in a textile mill in Barnwell, South Carolina. The home his mother provided had no electricity or indoor plumbing, painting a vivid picture of the poverty he endured as a child in the 1960s. Wallace grew into a popular teenager and was elected to the student council at Barnwell High School. He also had the distinction of being the school's only male cheerleader. Life after high school led to an unsuccessful attempt at college and to a job as a late-night radio DJ. His first known brush with legal trouble was there, as Wallace was fired for stealing records. Desperate for a way out of poverty, he enlisted in the U.S. Navy in 1985 when he was 20 years old. It was a move common for young African American to make if college or trade school weren't in the cards. Before he shipped out, he married his high school girlfriend and began a stint in the military that lasted seven years. But the Navy life didn't save Wallace from the vices that he eventually succumbed to. He developed quite a drug problem in the military, smoking crack cocaine and using other illicit substances. Wallace turned to petty theft and burglary while still an enlisted man, which ended up costing him his role in the Navy. After he was caught burglarizing a business, the military bid him farewell. His record as an exceptional sailor allowed Wallace to receive an honorable discharge, despite the circumstances. It was while he was in the Navy that Wallace committed his first murder. The body of 18-year-old Tashanda Bethia was found in a Barnwell, N.C. Pond in 1990, after Wallace had raped and strangled her. His developing drug addiction and his inability to keep consistent employment led to the deterioration of his marriage. He and his wife divorced soon after his Navy discharge. Wallace was still bouncing from job to job in May 1992 when he picked up Sharon Nance, a sex worker in Charlotte. After she demanded money from him for services rendered, he beat her to death and dumped her body next to nearby railroad tracks. Less than a month later, Wallace killed his third victim. This time, it was someone that he was acquainted with. Wallace had been dating a woman named Sadie McKnight, who shared an apartment with a fast food worker that Wallace would make his next victim. Caroline Love had just gotten off work and returned to her apartment when she was greeted by Wallace. The man had a key to the place, and it wasn't a surprise for her to see him there, even though McKnight wasn't present. After he made a pass that Love rebuffed, Wallace became angry and savagely beat the woman. After he choked her into unconsciousness, he removed her clothing, dragged her into the bathroom, and began to sexually assault her. Love began to wake and fight off Wallace. He responded by grabbing a nearby curling iron and choking her to death with the cord. He wrapped up her body and abandoned it in the woods. Wallace had begun working as a shift supervisor at a Charlotte Taco Bell. He began to prey upon his co-workers, raping and murdering several employees at the restaurant franchise before he was caught in 1994. Beginning with Love, the remaining eight murder victims were all known to Wallace. In February 1993, Wallace raped and murdered Taco Bell employee Shauna Hawk. Coworker Audrey Spain was the next victim, killed by Wallace that June. In August of that year, he killed a friend of his sister's. Valencia M. Jumper became Wallace's sixth murder victim, her body set on fire after she was choked to death. Single mother Michelle Stinson was strangled and stabbed to death in front of one of her sons. Stinson, like Hawk in Spain, was employed by Taco Bell. Vanessa Little Mac was the last of the fast food workers to be killed by Wallace, dying at his hands in February 1994. Local police believed that women in Charlotte might be falling prey to a serial killer. Lacking the resources or expertise to handle such a case, they appealed to help from the FBI and were summarily dismissed. The federal agency didn't feel that the murders in the city were linked, a move that might have cost several lives. And Wallace wasn't finished with his killing spree. 
In March, he attacked and killed a co-worker of his girlfriend, a Bojangles employee named Betty Jean Bauckham. He robbed her apartment when he was finished choking her to death and stole her car. That same night, Wallace murdered Brandy June Henderson. Henderson and her boyfriend lived in the same apartment building as Bauckham, and Wallace knew that the young mother would be alone that night. Wallace raped and murdered her, then set his sights on her infant son. He choked the baby, but he miraculously survived the attack. Days later, Wallace struck at the apartment complex again, this time stabbing and strangling Deborah and Slaughter. She was his last victim. Wallace had a lengthy police record at this point, stemming from his problems with petty theft and burglary. Balcom's car was discovered, and even though Wallace did a great job wiping his prints from its interior, he overlooked a handprint that he made on the trunk. This sealed Wallace's fate when he was arrested and prompted him to make a chilling confession. He told police that he had killed not only Bauckham, but ten other women. His crack addiction had gotten so out of hand that he was always finding himself desperate for money, and he raped and robbed his victims to get it. These admissions did nothing to spare him from the death penalty, however. He was found guilty and given nine death sentences. He is currently awaiting an execution date in a North Carolina prison. Some Charlotte community members criticized law enforcement's handling of the investigation, citing racial and socioeconomic inequities that kept police from properly conducting the murder cases. As all of Wallace's victims were black women, there have been opinions shared that blame indifference by police for the amount of time it took to finally arrest Wallace. The father of one of Wallace's victims came forward and stated to the press that the girls just weren't important to the police. They didn't live in a iron district. They weren't famous or known. They worked in fast food joints. And they didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes. To be sure, Wallace didn't fit the description of a serial killer as they were perceived to be 30 years ago. He was black, and serial killers were thought to have their hobbies cornered by white males. There was also a belief that serial killers mostly killed randomly and avoided murdering those that they knew, another erroneous thought. But a more thorough investigation of the murders should have shown strong links between the victims themselves, particularly the fact that four of them used to fill taco and burrito shells alongside Wallace at a Charlotte Taco Bell. Leonard Lake and Charles Ng Charles Ng was apprehended on June 2, 1985, for trying to steal a vice from a hardware store in San Francisco. What should have been a routine arrest turned out to be anything but ordinary. While the authorities were taking him into custody, his associate, Leonard Lake, arrived to pay for the stolen item. However, as the police soon discovered, Lake was involved in far more heinous offenses than petty theft. Following the arrest, an investigation revealed the horrifying truth that Leonard Lake, along with his partner Charles Ng, had been silently and savagely torturing about 25 individuals in a secluded cabin in Calaveras County for two years, and this was just the tip of the iceberg. Leonard Lake experienced a troubled state of mind in 1971, long before he crossed paths with Charles Ng. At that time, he had recently been discharged from the U.S. Marine Corps, after completing two tours of duty in the Vietnam War. During his last deployment, he experienced a mental breakdown and was subsequently diagnosed with a schizoid personality disorder. However, signs of this disorder had been evident in Lake for years, though it was only diagnosed after his military service. Even during his childhood, people who interacted with Lake sensed that there was something amiss about him. Leonard Lake was born in 1945, and while he was considered a bright child, that was the only praise he received. When his parents divorced when he was six years old, he and his siblings went to live with their grandmother. While his grandmother initially provided support for the children during their parents' separation, it appeared that she may have also played a role in the development of Lake's disturbed personality. When Lake was found forcing his sisters to pose nude for photographs, his grandmother looked the other way. When he became obsessed with pornography and started extorting his sisters to perform sexual acts, she didn't lift a finger. And, when Lake was found killing mice and other small animals and dissolving them in acid, she again did nothing. By some accounts, his grandmother even encouraged his nude photography. The absence of discipline or consequences for his behavior provided Leonard Lake with free reign. 
Without anything to restrain his psychotic tendencies, they only intensified, culminating in his later heinous actions. After Leonard Lake completed his high school education at Balboa High School in San Francisco in 1964, he joined the United States Marine Corps. As we already know, his two tours of duty in Vietnam culminated in a delusional breakdown, according to Army medical technicians. Consequently, he was honorably discharged and returned home. During this period, Leonard Lake stumbled upon a hippie commune located near San Francisco. He abandoned his studies at San Jose State University after only one semester to embrace the emerging free love culture that was gradually permeating the west coast of America. By 1975, it appeared that Leonard Lake had left his troubled past behind. He settled down in a hippie commune after marrying a woman he met there. However, his wife soon discovered his unsavory interests. She learned that he was involved in the production and participation of homemade, amateur pornography films, leading to the dissolution of their marriage and Lake's departure from the commune. Lake had a brief stint in prison in 1980 for car theft, but he managed to move on to Greenfield Ranch, another hippie community in Northern California that focused on self-sufficiency. It was there that he met Clara Lynn Ballish, whom he affectionately called Cricket, and married her after meeting her at a Renaissance fair. In contrast to Lake's first wife, Ballish was accepting of his private interests, including his involvement in amateur pornography. Unlike Lake's first wife, who divorced him after discovering his proclivities, Ballish not only accepted them but also offered to participate in his films. Lake spent the next eight years living on the ranch with his wife, indulging in his dark desires. However, it soon became clear that his amateur home videos were no longer enough to satisfy him. In 1983, Lake began to pursue even more sadistic fantasies. Leonard Lake, whether due to his schizoid personality disorder or the mounting paranoia that many Americans felt about nuclear war at the time, started to believe that a nuclear holocaust was imminent. He came up with a plan to build a survivalist bunker to survive the disaster, but the owner of Greenfield Ranch put a stop to it and made him find another location. Fortunately, Lake learned that his wife's family owned a cabin in the woods, which they were willing to rent to him. One of Lake's diary entries revealed his dark plan, which he called Operation Miranda. He wrote that in 1983, he intended to restart in Humboldt County and turn his bunker into a place where he could act out his sexual fantasies, protect himself and his possessions, and have some limited protection from nuclear fallout. It is speculated that soon after relocating to the cabin, Lake extended an invitation to his younger brother Donald and his friend Charles Gooner, who had served as the best man at his wedding to Balish. Whether they entered the dungeon voluntarily is unknown, but it was evident that they were murdered there. Lake then took their cash and identification, and assumed the identity of Charles Gooner. Leonard Lake's desires were not satisfied by the deaths of his brother and friend. In 1981, he placed an advertisement in a Wargamers magazine seeking a potential victim. However, instead of a victim, he found an accomplice in Charles Ng. Ng's life path closely mirrored that of Lake, despite being 15 years younger. Ng's childhood was marred by kleptomania, which made him infamous in his Hong Kong hometown. After being expelled from a British boarding school for stealing from his peers, he enrolled at the College of Notre Dame in California. Similar to Lake, Ng only lasted one semester in college. He was involved in a hit and run accident and joined the Marine Corps to avoid prosecution. However, his manic tendencies led to his dishonorable discharge in 1984 for desertion. It is unclear whether Lake had intended for Ng to be his next victim or if he had recognized similar psychotic tendencies in him as he had in himself, but Lake invited Ng to live with him at the Ballish cabin in the woods. Lake's prisoners were required to abide by a set of rules that included statements like I must always be prepared to serve my master and I must remain silent while locked in my cell. Lake and Ng embarked on a killing spree that lasted over a year, during which they abducted, tortured, and murdered multiple victims. They also stole the identities of their victims to obtain loans in their names and continue funding their survivalist bunker. However, their past history of kleptomania and identity theft eventually caught up with them. Between 1983 and 1985, Leonard Lake and Charles Ng engaged in a heinous killing spree, abducting, torturing, 
and sexually assaulting at least 8 to 25 victims, predominantly women, in their survivalist bunker. It's believed that they were preparing for a future nuclear holocaust and sought to repopulate the Earth with their victims. The exact number of their victims remains uncertain, as only 12 sets of remains were discovered on their property. However, police discovered a collection of charred human bone fragments weighing 45 pounds, leading them to believe there could be many more victims yet to be identified. Leonard Lake and Charles Inc. confined their male and female victims in a cinderblock bunker measuring 6.5 by 3.5 feet, which contained only a bucket and toilet paper. The bunker was equipped with a one-way mirror. After murdering their victims, Lake would dismember and dispose of their bodies using a method he learned in his childhood dissolving them in different chemicals and acids. They then scattered the remaining body parts throughout the cabin's grounds. Leonard Lake and Charles Ng were responsible for the murder of several people, including Robin Stapley, Paul Costner, Harvey and Deborah Dobbs, and multiple local children. Lake's belongings contained videotapes of the two men torturing and raping their victims. In some cases, the partners were forced to watch their wives being sexually assaulted before being killed. One victim, Deborah or Debbie Dobbs, was so violently sexually assaulted on tape that she could not have survived the ordeal. The men hogtied various women, forced them into oral sex and orgies, or put in leg irons. The sex captives were aged anywhere between 12 and 20-something, and only six of the women featured in these home movies were later found alive. Fifteen of them remain missing. A former cellmate of Charles Ng claimed that the serial killer boasted about using a power drill and pliers to sexually torture and disfigure women. Ng reportedly used the pliers to tear off nipples, inserted a power drill attachment into their vaginas, inserted rods into their anuses, and used vice grips to break their knuckles. The killers did not seem to have a specific preference for victims besides their shared desire to torture women. They also targeted and killed both children and men. Shockingly, they even murdered an entire family of three, including their neighbors Lonnie Bond and Brenda O'Connor, who had a two-year-old son. The killers didn't seem to have any specific criteria for choosing their victims, other than their proximity. They may have chosen their victims based on convenience or a lack of effort to search for more distant targets. However, the murderous spree of Leonard Lake and Charles Hink came to an end after just two years. In 1985, the two killers were finally apprehended due to a petty theft incident. During a trip to San Francisco in June of 1985, Charles Ng attempted to steal a vice from a hardware store, but was caught by the clerk. Ng called Leonard Lake for help, who arrived at the store to try and pay for the vice. However, the police had already been called and began to question Lake. When Lake presented a driver's license with a different name and no resemblance to him, the police became suspicious. It was later discovered that the license belonged to a missing person named Scott Stapley, who had been missing for several months. Additionally, law enforcement officers discovered an illegal firearm with a silencer in the trunk of Lake's vehicle, registered to a Paul Costner, who was also reported missing from San Francisco. Upon arresting Charles Ng for shoplifting and Leonard Lake for illegal possession of a firearm with a silencer, Police searched the cabin dungeon and uncovered several stolen vehicles, along with around 40 pounds of human bones that had been crushed and burned. Upon searching the cabin dungeon, authorities uncovered treasure maps that directed them to buried five-gallon buckets. In one bucket, police found a significant number of stolen identification papers, credit cards, and personal items, suggesting that Lake had killed at least 25 people. In the other bucket, police found something even more alarming several pages from Lake's personal journals and videotapes of the sexual assault and torture of two women. Although authorities were able to identify the remains of 12 people found on the property, it is suspected that the actual number of victims could be as high as 25 or more. Leonard Lake appeared to have known that he would never escape prison. Before his arrest, he had hidden cyanide pills in his clothing. While in custody, he swallowed some of the pills and died in prison without facing charges. In contrast, his partner in crime, Charles Ng, faced trial for 11 counts of murder. He was found guilty and was sentenced to death by lethal injection in 1999. Ng remains on death row in San Quentin State Prison. 
Randy Stephen Kraft Born in 1945 in Long Beach, California, Randy Stephen Kraft had an upbringing where his father was known for his emotional distance, while his mother took an active role, participating in the PTA at Kraft's elementary school. Kraft's exceptional intelligence stood out to his teachers, leading to an invitation to accelerated classes during his junior high years. During high school, he took the initiative to establish a world affairs club and nurtured aspirations of becoming a U.S. senator. Despite realizing his own homosexuality during this time, he chose to conceal this aspect of his identity from family and friends. Upon completing high school and ranking 10th in his class, Kraft pursued an economics education at Claremont McKenna College, an all-male institution. In his initial year, he joined the Reserve Officers Training Corps and engaged in pro-Vietnam War demonstrations while lending his support to conservative political candidates. Upon completing his college education, Kraft enlisted in the U.S. Air Force, steadily advancing to the rank of Airman First Class. During the same year as his promotion, he chose to disclose his homosexuality to his parents. While his mother's response was characterized as a mix of disapproval and comprehension, his father's reaction turned into a fit of anger. Concurrently, Kraft informed his superiors within the Air Force about his sexual orientation. This decision led to his discharge in June 1969, officially attributed to medical reasons. Following his release from the Air Force, Kraft returned to his parental home and embarked on a career as a bartender. During this time, a significant event occurred when he encountered a 13-year-old runaway named Joey Franche. Kraft offered Franche a place to stay, yet upon arriving at Kraft's residence, he subjected the young boy to drugging and sexual assault. Subsequently, Franche managed to escape while Kraft was away at work, though he refrained from informing the police about the sexual assault. Instead, he recounted a tale of being physically beaten by Kraft and ingesting pills voluntarily. The authorities conducted a search of Kraft's apartment, although without a proper warrant, resulting in no charges being filed. The spree of killings commenced in 1971, targeting exclusively male victims aged between 13 and 35, with a significant portion having military ties, particularly in the Marine Corps. Randy Stephen Kraft's initial suspected target was Wayne Duquette, a bartender employed at the gay establishment known as The Stables. On October 5, 1971, authorities discovered the remains of the 30-year-old man discarded near California's Ortega Highway. Unfortunately, due to significant decomposition, any potential indicators of foul play had become indiscernible by the time the body was found. His demise was officially attributed to alcohol poisoning. Commencing in 1972, a series of bodies started appearing along various highways throughout California. All victims were male, and a majority displayed evidence of traumatic events or torture. Among these unfortunate individuals, some exhibited signs of bindings, beatings, and bite marks, while others bore indications of strangulation. Several had experienced acts of sodomy, castration, or dismemberment. Notably, a minimum of four victims were discovered with foreign objects inserted into their bodies. Between the years 1973 and 1975, a total of 14 victims were connected to a single perpetrator. During the FBI's investigation, this individual was profiled as possessing above-average intelligence, displaying meticulous and organized tendencies. The investigators also speculated that the perpetrator might have undergone military training. Despite their efforts, a concrete suspect remained elusive. In May 1975, a potentially significant breakthrough occurred when the skull of a young man named Keith Crotwell was discovered near the Long Beach Marina. Two witnesses recalled encountering a drug Crotwell in a Ford Mustang a few months prior within the same vicinity. This information led to the location of the car, and subsequently, the police were contacted with the license plate number. Kraft underwent police interrogation, but was subsequently released due to insufficient evidence. The coroner ultimately determined Crotwell's demise to be the result of accidental drowning. Fast forward to May 14, 1983, when Kraft was pulled over by two California Highway Patrol officers for a lane violation. During their approach, it was noted that Kraft's pants were unbuttoned. Upon searching his vehicle, 
the officers uncovered the lifeless body of 25-year-old Marine Terry Lee Gambrell. Kraft's immediate arrest followed. Upon a more exhaustive examination of his car, a shocking wealth of incriminating evidence surfaced, an extensive collection of over 70 photographs featuring deceased or incapacitated men, substantial quantities of drugs and alcohol, as well as seats stained with blood. Further investigation of the trunk led to the discovery of a coded, handwritten list. By September 10, 1983, following an exhaustive search of Kraft's residence and thorough questioning of numerous witnesses, law enforcement had amassed a substantial amount of evidence to formally charge Randy Stephen Kraft with 16 counts of homicide. Remarkably, the list discovered contained a staggering 60 markings, prompting investigators to speculate that the actual number of victims might be even higher. The trial proceedings commenced on September 26, 1988, marking a significant moment as it became the costliest trial in the history of Orange County. This legal spectacle spanned over 13 months. Following a deliberation period of three days, the jury delivered a verdict of guilty on all 16 murder counts against Kraft. His sentencing was pronounced on November 29, 1989, resulting in the imposition of the death penalty. Presently, Randy Stephen Kraft occupies a cell on death row within California's San Quentin State Prison. Despite his conviction, he maintains his assertion of innocence. Nathaniel Barjona, originally named David Paul Brown, was born in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1957. Disturbing signs of his abnormal behavior manifested early in his life. In 1964, at the tender age of seven, Barjona received an Ouija board as a birthday gift. Under the guise of trying out the board, he lured a five-year-old neighbor into his basement, where he attempted to strangle her. Fortunately, the girl's desperate cries alerted Barjona's mother, who rushed downstairs and compelled him to release his captive. Barjona's mother likely assumed that her son's actions were those of a child who didn't fully comprehend the gravity of his actions, and thus, the incident went unresolved. However, in 1970, he repeated his disturbing behavior. Under the pretense of sledding, he enticed a six-year-old neighbor into a secluded area and subjected the child to sexual assault. This disturbing pattern of behavior continued to haunt Nathaniel Barjona as he grew older. As he matured, he developed a more elaborate modus operandi for gaining access to his victims. In 1975, Barjona posed as a police officer to approach an eight-year-old boy en route to school. Deceptively claiming authority, he lured the child into his car, where he subjected the boy to sexual assault and attempted strangulation. Fortuitously, a vigilant neighbor, peering out of their window, bore witness to the boy's abduction and promptly alerted the police. Barjona found himself apprehended, but the legal outcome was surprisingly lenient, resulting in a mere one-year probationary sentence. This mild punishment, rather than deterring Barjona, seemed to embolden him. Three years later, he embarked on another horrifying episode, abducting two boys from a movie theater by impersonating a police officer and falsely claiming they were under arrest. After handcuffing his victims, he transported them to an isolated location where he subjected them to molestation. In a desperate bid to silence a potential witness, Barjona initiated strangulation on one of the children. Convinced that the boy had perished, he placed the other victim in the trunk of his vehicle and drove away. Remarkably, the supposedly deceased boy survived the attack and saw help, leading to Barjona's eventual discovery by the police, with the second victim still confined in his trunk. This time, the charges against Barjona escalated to attempted murder, resulting in a sentencing of 18 to 20 years in prison. During his incarceration, Barjona engaged in sessions with a psychiatrist. The chilling revelations of his fantasies, which revolved around the gruesome acts of murdering, dissecting, and even consuming children, compelled the psychiatrist to recommend his transfer to a mental hospital. However, in 1991, a puzzling turn of events occurred when a judge concurred with psychiatric assessments that, for some reason, did not classify Barjona as a dangerous threat. In a bewildering decision, the judge granted Barjona probation under the condition that he relocate to Montana to reside with his mother, though it was strongly recommended that he seek psychiatric assistance. Merely days after his release, 
Barjona targeted a seven-year-old boy who was seated in a parked car. He forcibly entered the vehicle and attempted to suffocate the child by sitting atop him. Fortunately, the boy's mother intervened, thwarting Barjona's actions and resulting in his swift arrest. Remarkably, after his apprehension, there was a conspicuous absence of communication between Massachusetts court authorities and Montana probation officers, despite Barjona's rapid flight to Montana. This oversight allowed him to assimilate into the local community. Concurrently, he changed his name from David Brown to Nathaniel Benjamin Levi Barjona, offering varying claims about his Jewish identity, leaving the actual truth shrouded in uncertainty. Despite the name alteration, little about his character appeared to change. In 1996, a troubling incident unfolded when Zachary Ramsey mysteriously disappeared while en route to school. Concerned for their child, his parents promptly filed a missing person report. However, the local police department, unaccustomed to handling such cases, struggled to make headway in the investigation. With scant leads to pursue, the case eventually grew cold. During this unsettling period, Nathaniel Barjona resided in a nearby apartment complex. In a disturbing and covert manner, he lured young boys from the vicinity into his apartment, subjecting them to sexual assaults. Shockingly, he had even rigged a pulley system from the ceiling, utilizing it to suspend at least one victim by the neck. These heinous crimes remained concealed for several years, shrouded in secrecy. It wasn't until one observant woman noticed a troubling change in her child's behavior, a sudden withdrawal and anger following interactions with Barjona. However, the inconceivable notion that child molestation could occur in Great Falls prevented any significant suspicion from emerging. Moreover, Barjona's status as a potential murderer remained unsuspected. Nevertheless, some neighbors did raise concerns regarding the peculiar meat content in the meals Barjona prepared for them. The source of this unusual meat puzzled them, and when questioned, Barjona attributed it to deer he claimed to have hunted, although no one had ever known him to engage in such activities. In 1999, an alarming incident unfolded when Nathaniel Barjona was apprehended outside a local elementary school, clad in a police officer's uniform and carrying a fake firearm. Initially, the charge brought against him was one of impersonating a police officer. However, the subsequent search of Barjona's residence yielded a profoundly unsettling discovery. Within Nathaniel Barjona's home, investigators uncovered a trove of thousands of photographs of children meticulously cut from magazines. They also stumbled upon a peculiar journal filled with cryptic code. Of even greater significance for the ongoing investigation, a fragment of human bone was among the findings. The journal was promptly forwarded to the FBI for decoding, coinciding with the police's exploration of the possibility that Barjona may have played a role in Ramsey's disappearance. Simultaneously, additional neighbors came forward with accusations of child molestation against Barjona, leading to swift charges of kidnapping and sexual assault. By the time the trial commenced, the FBI had successfully deciphered Barjona's cryptic journal. Inside its pages, he chillingly detailed his fixation on torturing and murdering children. Moreover, a list containing 22 names emerged. Eight of these names were confirmed as Nathaniel Barjona's prior victims, while many others were local children. Regrettably, the identities of the remaining individuals on the list remained elusive. Even more unsettlingly, the diary dealt into his gruesome intentions to prepare and consume children. Little Boy Stew, Barbecue Kid, My Little Kid Dessert and Little Boy Pot Pies were all entries in the horrific diary. Coupled with the discovery of a meat grinder in Barjona's residence, these writings ignited a profoundly disturbing suspicion. In light of the peculiar meals Barjona had offered to his neighbors, a chilling question arose, had Barjona murdered Ramsey and served his remains to unsuspecting individuals? However, Barjona vehemently denied any involvement in Ramsey's death. Sadly, there was insufficient evidence to definitively confirm or refute these allegations of cannibalism, although a surplus of circumstantial evidence left lingering doubts. Furthermore, there remained a dearth of concrete evidence to substantiate the claim that Barjona had committed the murder of Ramsey in the first place. The situation grew more perplexing when the boy's mother expressed her doubts about his involvement, ultimately leading to the dismissal of charges. 
Instead, Barjona received a 130-year prison sentence for the molestation charges. Within the community, some contemplated seeking their own form of justice, with one resident even stating to the press that if Barjona were ever released, his life wouldn't be worth a plug nickel around here. However, Nathaniel Barjona would never face such a scenario. In 2008, he was discovered lifeless in his prison cell, afflicted by severe obesity and succumbing to cardiovascular disease. To this day, the true extent of Nathaniel Barjona's murderous actions remains shrouded in uncertainty. He stands as a possible suspect in multiple homicides across Massachusetts, Wyoming, and Montana, yet none of these cases have been definitively resolved. As we conclude our journey through the lives of these five terrifying serial killers, it's a stark reminder of the darkness that can exist within the human soul. The stories we've uncovered are deeply disturbing, and the pain inflicted on the victims and their families is immeasurable. It's important to remember that behind the sensationalism and fascination with true crime, there are real people whose lives were forever altered by these atrocities. Our thoughts are with the victims and their loved ones. Thank you for joining us on this chilling journey. If you found this video informative and thought-provoking, please like, share, and subscribe. Your support helps us continue to explore these dark corners of history. And if you have any suggestions for future topics or cases you'd like us to cover, please leave them in the comments below. Until next time, stay safe, stay aware, and never forget the importance of seeking justice for the victims.